This presentation was originally given for Veterans Day 2021 as part of the Mitchell County Historical Society celebration of our veterans. It is about the Cherokee War of 1776, and it is presented by Jonathan Bennett, who's a Yancey County native and works with the National Park Service in Spruce Spine, North Carolina. Jonathan's a graduate of Wake Forest University. He is a double major in history and archaeology there. He's also done some graduate work at East Carolina University, where he specialized in military history, focusing specifically on the American Revolution in the South. He's worked as both an archaeology lab tech and field tech and has participated in several digs and archaeological surveys dealing with the Cherokee, including one on the Trail of Tears site known as Burnt Stand. He is co-author of the book Images of America, Mount Mitchell, and has spent the last 19 years working for the National Park Service as an interpretation and education ranger. He's been the incident commander of the Blue Ridge Parkway's American Revolutionary War Festival that's known as the Overmountain Victory Celebration for the past 15 years. He also grew up in these mountain hollows, and several of his ancestors were participants in the events of this program. We now welcome you to stay tuned for Jonathan Bennett and the Cherokee War of 1776. While the ink was drying on the Declaration of Independence as it sat on a wooden table in the hot, stuffy Pennsylvania State House, soon to be known as Independence Hall, war cries were echoing through the coves and hollows of the Blue Ridge Mountains. War had broken out on the frontier between the Cherokee nations and the American settlers. The Cherokee were desperate to save their ancestral home and traditional way of life from the ever-increasing number of white settlers encroaching farther and farther into their territory. To many of the younger Cherokee warriors, like Dragon Canoe, war seemed to be the only possible solution to the dilemma they faced. Many of the older Cherokees disagreed as memories of the death and destruction of the last major war with the whites had, uh, was still haunting their memories. But how did the situation come uh, to this? To answer that, we need to look further back in history than just the beginnings of the American Revolution. First of all, let me give you basically just a quick brief sketch of um, the Cherokee Nation. Um, the Cherokee, um, at the time of European contact, um, and even today, uh, well, back then, the uh, Cherokee didn't call themselves the Cherokee, but they called themselves um, the Aniyunwia, which means the real people or the principal people. Uh, the word Cherokee is actually probably derived from a Creek word, meaning people of a different language. Um, the Cherokee language itself was a um, part of the Iroquois family of language uh, languages, uh, with and it had three distinct dialects spoken. Etali, which uh, is now extinct and was spoken in the lower Cherokee towns, Atali, uh, which was spoken in the overhill and valley towns, that's uh, the language of Cherokee that they now speak in Oklahoma, and Kitawa. Uh, spoken in the middle towns and is what is now uh, today spoken on the koala boundary on the Cherokee Indian Reservation. The um, man that you see on the screen is uh, Sequoia and he is famous uh, for inventing the Cherokee syllabary. Uh, the Cherokee were one of the only uh, people to actually invent um, basically a, a sort of a version of an alphabet to be able to write their uh, language down. But uh, in the uh, time that we're talking about today, uh, Sequoia uh, was only six years old, and he was living in one of the Overhill villages. And so um, it would be uh, several decades before uh, he would get around to inventing that syllabary. So during the Cherokee War of 1776, they did not have that invented yet. The Cherokee um, relied uh, heavily on agriculture, particularly on maize or corn, and they would uh, refer to um, their three primary crops as the three sisters. Those uh, three crops were corn, beans, and squash. And they also raised other crops in addition to that, such as pumpkins and sunflowers. Most of the farm work, well, virtually all of the farm work, in fact, was done by the women. You would occasionally have the men come out for certain tasks at certain times of the year, but for the most part, uh, the farming was done uh, by the Cherokee women. And so um, they were uh, essential in that part of the economy. Uh, 
Now, the Cherokee men, uh, they uh, did a lot of hunting, particularly for animals such as white-tailed deer and uh, other things like that. They uh, uh, gathered uh, different wild food crops, uh, such as um, fish. Uh, They would build uh, fish weirs in the creeks and streams where the uh, fish would swim into them and get caught in traps. Uh, In fact, uh, the Cherokee even uh, discovered that if they took the hulls of black walnuts and they sprinkled it in the water, that there was a chemical in that black walnut that would paralyze the fish gills and they would float up to the surface and then they could just pick up the fish and put them in the baskets. Uh, So that's pretty much um, how they were um, making uh, most of their living. Now, the uh, Cherokee uh, society was based on a clan system, and there were seven Cherokee clans. Um, Those clans included the Deer Clan, the Wolf Clan, the Bird Clan, the Long Hair Clan, the Blue Clan, the Wild Potato Clan, and the Paint Clan. It is thought that before European contact, there may have been as many as 14 clans um, before Europeans got here, and some of those uh, older clans got preserved as subclans that got incorporated in the other ones, uh, such as uh, the bear and the wild cat, uh, or panther clan, uh, amongst others. Now, Cherokee clans are matrilineal, and that's a fancy word meaning that um, most of the or that their society was based primarily around women. Like um, when a husband would uh, uh, marry a woman, instead of the woman uh, or his wife mar- uh, joining his clan, he always joined the wife's clan. Um, any children that were born to them were considered to be part of the mother's clan, not the father's clan. And in fact, uh, in raising the children, uh, the mother and her brothers or the child's uncles uh, were primarily responsible for raising the young Cherokee children, whereas the father uh, served more as a role of a mentor to the youngers. The uh, home that the uh, man and the wife would share uh, belonged to the woman. And so um, uh, they had a very interesting society, uh, especially when it came to uh, women's rights. In fact, uh, a lot of Cherokee uh, women had far more rights uh, amongst their people than their counterparts in the colonial and uh, early American societies had. So uh, definitely something uh, of interest. Now, the clan structure also uh, had a very important uh, part of it. That was a part that was called the blood law. Uh, And basically, in blood law, it means that if someone harmed or killed a member of your clan, then your clan was obligated to take revenge on the offending clan, and not necessarily uh, the person that actually did the crime themselves. Uh, You could take revenge on anyone from the offending person's clan. Now, traditional Cherokee government, we... um, A lot of times, uh, I guess this idea comes from Westerns and other things like that, but we tend to sort of think of a lot of Native American societies as having a chief that uh, function more or less like a king, but that's definitely not true of most Native American societies, and it's not true of the Cherokee either. The Cherokee government was... Uh, focused primarily on the town. And so each uh, town or village had two different governments. Uh, They had a white government that governed in peacetime, and they had a red government uh, that governed in wartime. Uh, The white government included the chief, who was given the title of beloved man, the chief's advisors, counselors for each clan, a council of elders, a speaker, messengers, and ceremonial officers. Now, the red government included the great war chief, the great war chief second, seven war counselors, a beloved woman who was also known as the war woman, the chief war speaker, messengers, ceremonial officers, and scouts. Now, the beloved woman is a really interesting position uh, because that uh, person was, uh, and that lady was in charge of deciding what uh, would happen to any captives that were taken in wartime. Uh, They could be adopted into the tribe or they could be put to death. So there's a lot of different things that could end up happening with them. And that decision was to left up entirely to the women. Now, The uh, Cherokee peace chief was in charge of domestic issues, and also he was in charge of the ceremonial life of the town. The war chief dealt with matters involving outsiders, and uh, that included not just in times of war, but in times of peace as well. So um, the war chief dealt with negotiations, alliances, trade, and other external matters. 
In fact, a lot of the colonial governments and even the United States itself dealt almost exclusively with the war chiefs and many of them were unaware that the peace chiefs even existed in the tribe. Each Cherokee town had a council uh, with, which had an assembly of all men and women. The council uh, met nightly in the council house, which was the largest structure in the town. It was seven-sided, uh, so uh, each uh, person could sit with their own clan inside the council house, uh, with the leaders sitting near the center. And inside the council house, no weapons were permitted to be brought inside. Among the Cherokee, everyone was able to participate in the councils. The chiefs had an advisory role, and their power lay in their ability to persuade basically through speeches and oratory. Unlike the Europeans, none of these chiefs had the powers of a king or a prince where they could coerce people through their authority. After the chiefs spoke, each person had an opportunity to speak for themselves. Issues were discussed until a consensus was reached. There was an emphasis on deliberation and on the process of reaching consensus. The council could not pass a law and could not regulate conduct. So, um, so they had to convince everyone that it was a good idea of what they were wanting to do. Now, um, with regard to the protocol of speaking and listening to the councils, it was considered to be offensive if anyone interrupted another person that was uh, already speaking. The uh, focus on gaining consistency and listening to all the opinions. It was an attempt to avoid controversy. And in fact, when individuals realized that they did not agree with what the majority of the opinion was, they would often withdraw from the council so they would not disrupt the ability of the council to achieve that much needed consensus. Now, um, the uh, Cherokee towns and villages, they have had a different couple of different kinds of houses. The uh, house that you're seeing here in the foreground with the brown uh, mud walls, that type of house is called an asi, and they were made of wattle and daub. Basically, you would uh, uh, drive some posts into the ground, and then uh, a lot of times the floor was actually dug out some. And then you would weave vines, strips of wood, or river cane in between the frames and then coat them with a plaster that was made of clay. These houses frequently had thatched roofs uh, or bark roofs. In the summertime, they would have a house that was uh, much more conducive to the hot, muggy weather that you would have. So instead of um, having uh, walls that would hold in a lot of the heat and whatnot, you would have no walls. That way you could sleep uh, in the open air and be a lot more comfortable in those hot, muggy nights that you're going to have in the middle of the summer, especially in the river bottoms where all their villages were. Uh, the photo or the picture you're seeing here, this is a... Um, a painting that is part of the uh, National Park Service archives and this shows uh, the layout of a traditional Cherokee town. You can see that it has a protective uh, wall that is uh, built around the town and this one in particular not only does it have a palisade wall that's made of um, tree trunks that are uh, been dug and uh, put in the ground but they've even uh, uh, done wattle and daub along the sides of the walls to make it harder for people to run up and stick a rifle through that and shoot at the people on the inside or to wedge themselves in between uh, the posts. Uh, you'll also notice that there's a mound in the middle of the town as well as um, a lot of the other features that you're uh, seeing there. Now Cherokee towns and the organization of the tribe, well, like I was saying, was organized around these towns. And um, you had several different towns uh, located in different areas. Those towns are known to, uh, were known at the time and known today as the lower towns, the out towns, the middle towns, the valley towns, and the overhill towns. And they were clustered around different river valleys. The lower towns were found in South Carolina and Georgia at the headwaters of the Savannah River primarily. And they included important sites such as uh, Seneca, Kiowee, uh, and Estato uh, were some of the most important of those. Now, if you're listening to this and you're in Yancey, Mitchell, Avery counties, or what we call the Tow River Valley, um, you, your ears might have picked up uh, or perked up at hearing the name Estato. There is a community in uh, Mitchell County known as Estato today, and the connection between it and the Cherokee town of Estato hasn't been fully determined, 
But we do know that the Cherokee at one time, uh, a couple of hundred years before European contact, did have permanent settlements uh, and towns in the lower part of the Toe River Valley or pr uh, primarily around the Cane River Valley to be specific. But we don't know what the names of those towns would have been. And it was considered a traditional thing that if you were to have a Cherokee village or town and you moved it to a new location, that you kept the name of the town. You didn't really rename it to something else. So it is possible, although not, uh, we can't tell you for certain, that the uh, Cherokee town of Esteto in South Carolina could possibly at some time in the past before European contact have been located, maybe even at the Cane River Middle School site, which was uh, definitely a Cherokee town, uh, but we, of course, don't know the name of what that town was today. Also keep in mind that, uh, as I was saying earlier, these different groups of towns have different dialects of the Cherokee language. So we tend to think of the Cherokee as being one super homogenous group, but they didn't have as much contact with each other as you would expect them to. So that's one reason that those uh, dialects developed. It also shows that there wasn't as much of the tight control that we like to pretend existed there. Uh, the uh, really unified Cherokee Nation would be something that would be a product that would happen after European contact that you're going to have where everybody's going to, as a response to the European pressures. So they had to get more organized at that point. So uh, besides the lower towns, uh, you've got the out, middle, and valley towns. All of those are located in North Carolina. The valley towns uh, were located along the Hiawassee, the Natahala, and the Valley Rivers. And a couple of their uh, primary uh, villages were Tomotli and Chioe. The middle towns were located along the upper Little Tennessee River drainage. And those middle towns included uh, villages such as Nukasi. Now, the out towns were located along the Okunalufte and Tuskegee rivers, and um, some of those towns included Jory and Kitawa. The out towns are, you may recognize, those form the location of the current Cherokee Indian Reservation on the Koala boundary. Now, the over the hill towns, and they're called that because they're literally over the mountain ridges uh, in East Tennessee, those towns were located along the Teleco, the Upper Tennessee River, and the Lower Little Tennessee Rivers. And the most prominent of those towns, at least at the time period we're talking about, was a place called, uh, or a town called Choda. And Choda uh, wasn't the only really important one over there. You also had other villages, one of those being Tennessee, uh, which is where the name Tennessee for the state would eventually come from. The overhill towns were considered to be the most powerful of the towns of uh, the Cherokee tribe. And they produced some of the most prominent Cherokees over the years. People such as Sequoia, Nancy Ward, Atticulacula, Oconestota, Dragon Canoe, and Old Tassel were all uh, from the overhill towns. Now, the Cherokee Nation, now the places that I'm talking about now, this is where you're having all of your permanent Cherokee towns and villages. But even though they're all sort of clustered together there in southeast Tennessee, southwest North Carolina, upper east Georgia, and upper southwest South Carolina, uh, or upper northwest South Carolina, they claimed a lot more territory than that. In fact, the Cherokee Nation claimed territory that comprises portions of eight states today. They uh, claimed virtually all of the state of Kentucky, a big uh, section of West Virginia, Virginia, most of Tennessee, a good part of North Carolina. They also claimed parts of Alabama, Georgia, and South Carolina. So while their permanent towns were clustered not terribly far away from each other, most of this other territory that they're claiming is um, hunting grounds. And so uh, it wouldn't be unusual to find uh, bands of Cherokee hunters out taking advantage of uh, different places in there. Now, the uh, Cherokee weren't the only tribe in the area. They had interactions with a lot of other tribes. Uh, there was the Catawba, uh, which are uh, primarily going to find in upstate South Carolina and western North Carolina. There were the Creeks, which you're going to find in Georgia and Alabama and whatnot. You're also going to have a lot of interaction with the Chickasaws, which are in Mississippi and Alabama and western Tennessee. You also have the Shawnees, which are going to be, they're going to have a lot more interaction with them up in Kentucky and Ohio in that area. 
And then, of course, the one that you may be surprised that they had a lot of interaction with are the Iroquois nations that are found up around the Great Lakes. In fact, they carried on a long-distance war against the Iroquois that lasted probably more than a century, if not more than that. Now, those kinds of wars uh, that the uh, Cherokee and the other tribes in the eastern U.S. were taking part in are known as mourning wars. Mourning wars are low-intensity, low-casualty conflicts resembling blood feuds that began long before European contact and virtually never resorted in larger battles or decisive defeats. These wars served five main purposes. First and most importantly, they were a way to avenge the deaths of family and fellow tribesmen and clansmen at the hands of other tribes. Second, they allowed the young warriors the opportunity to earn prestige and respect that they were going to need to become influential members of their own tribe. Third, they boosted or maintained the tribe's population as captives could be adopted into the tribe, replacing members that had died. Fourth, these wars served a spiritual and psychological function. Basically, they uh, were a way to ease grief and cope with the loss of loved ones. And finally, these wars provided a steady source of captives that were needed for certain rituals. These captives that could be adopted in the tribe were sometimes forced to do certain rituals in order to gain admittance into the tribe. And one of those rituals was um, something called running the gauntlet, which basically they had to uh, run between two lines of members of the uh, tribe that they were had been captured by, and they would be beaten with sticks and other things. And if they made it to the other side, then the beloved woman could decide that they could be in, adopted into the tribe, and th then they would be become full members of the Cherokee Nation. In fact, they would uh, be adopted into families and uh, be treated just the same as if they were uh, biological children. This uh, went along a lot with the different tribes in the East, and so there are quite a few members of all the tribes that were born into other members that ended up getting uh, captured and adopted into different tribes. Now, one of the important things of the Cherokee in the 1700s especially is their trading relationship that they began with the British. And they established a long distance trade with the British, especially those that were living in Charleston, South Carolina. And this trade became more and more important over the years. The Cherokees would go out and hunt and they would take furs and skins of animals, primarily um, uh, the uh, furs and skins of beaver and white-tailed deer, uh, white-tailed deer being considered the uh, backbone of this trade. And they would uh, trade that for manufactured items uh, such as rifles, copper kettles, axes, knives, bolts of cloth, and other European manufactured goods. Now this uh, trade in white-tailed deer skins uh, was so important that we actually still remember a lot of this today in our language. If you ever go into a store and you ask how much is that little doggy in the window and the person tells you it's 50 bucks, well, that's a reference back to these fur trading days whenever you would go in and you could trade a white-tailed deer skin, also known as a buckskin, for $1. And so that became such a standard price and the word buckskin eventually got shortened to buck and entered our language as slang. Now the um, beaver and the otter were also important parts of this fur trade. The beaver pelt in the market in Charleston in the 1760s bring you about $5 per pelt depending upon the quality, whereas the otter pelt was probably the most prized fur you could get and that would bring you $7 per pelt in the otter. Now. To give you an idea of just how much money this is, like $1 and $5, that doesn't sound like a whole lot, but when you're talking about moving large numbers of these, that's um, more money that you could make in a year doing this fur trading or long hunting than a European farmer uh, that was in North Carolina could make in his entire lifetime. So there was lots of money to be found in this. Now, um, as the demand for these um, goods increased. That led to increased hunting, which required more territory, and the having to have more territory, that increased the conflicts that they had with other tribes who were also becoming dependent upon this same system. 
when I say dependent, I mean literally they were almost becoming addicted to this trade because these uh, uh, items were so much in demand amongst the Cherokee and some of these other tribes that they really just had to have them. And they were items that they could not manufacture themselves. And so not only were they becoming sort of addicted to this trade, but they even started losing knowledge of a lot of their traditional tool making and crafts to do a lot of the things that they were doing that before this trade got going. Now, um, this uh, dependence on this trade also increased uh, tensions because a lot of the white long hunters would frequently trespass onto their land and hunt and, in their eyes, steal these valuable resources. And so that also became a big problem and sticking point. Now, in the 1750s, you had the French and Indian War break out. And when the French and Indian War first started, the Cherokee, they uh, ended up siding with the British initially. And the French and Indian War basically would be an experience that they would find to be far bloodier and more destructive than the morning wars that they had traditionally fought. And so this would actually set the stage for a lot of the, uh, the wars that were to come. The Cherokee warriors went north and served in some of the campaigns against the French and their Indian allies. And as they were coming home, a group of them felt that because they had been serving the, uh, the British and the colonial interests in fighting the French and their Indian allies, that they were entitled to some of the horses in order to make it back to uh, their, the Cherokee towns in North Carolina, South Carolina, and what would become Tennessee. Well, the uh, Virginia settlers that they took those horses from didn't see it that way. They basically considered it to be straight up horse theft. And uh, horse theft on the frontier was dealt with harshly. In fact, uh, they uh, called out the Virginia militia and they set up an ambush in which they uh, killed and scalped more than three dozen Cherokee warriors in order to retrieve those horses. And this basically uh, set them on the road to war with the British. Now, remember the clan law that I had been talking about before, where you could take revenge not just on the people that had perpetrated the crime, but on their clan? Well, the Cherokee um, viewed a lot of the English as being part of the same clan. So even though it was members of the Virginia militia that uh, inflicted those losses on the Cherokee tribe, in revenge and retaliation, they ended up killing settlers on the South Carolina frontier. And so the uh, governor of South Carolina retaliated to that by cutting off all of the gunpowder and arms shipments that the Cherokees needed. And they needed these arms and ammunition not just to defend themselves against the French and their Indian allies, which they had basically went to war with at the behest of the British, but also uh, they needed the, that same ammunition and to, do their, to carry on their hunting trade that they had become dependent upon. So uh, to calm the situation down, a delegation of uh, Cherokee chiefs and prominent men went to South Carolina uh, to try to negotiate a settlement. Well, they um, took them prisoner and put them in prison and demanded that, that they would not release those Cherokee, that Cherokee delegation until the Cherokees had turned over the perpetrators of the warriors that had uh, slain those people on the South Carolina frontier. Well, the Cherokee considered this uh, to be a grave insult. And instead of uh, turning the uh, uh, guilty warriors over, they simply attacked the fort where the Cherokee delegation was being held. And in that attack, they managed to kill the commander of the fort. Well, his replacement in retaliation for that ended up executing the entire Cherokee delegation that was in prison there. And so the result was the Anglo-Cherokee uh, War of 1760. And so this uh, war featured some horrific scenes that could really come straight out of the movie Last of the Mohicans. Uh, one of those scenes took place in today, what's uh, today, East Tennessee, not far from the city of Knoxville. What you're seeing on the screen now is a reconstruction of Fort Loudoun. And uh, Fort Loudoun is a Tennessee state park today that you can go and visit. But Fort Loudoun had actually been constructed in the, when the French and Indian War broke out at the request of the Cherokee tribe because they knew that in siding with the uh, British that the French and their Indian allies would try to raid the Cherokee villages that were located not far away. So the British went over and they built this fort and they put a garrison of British troops over there to protect the Cherokee. 
Well, whenever the Anglo-Cherokee War broke out, the Cherokee viewed this not as a bit of protection at this point, but as a grave threat to them. And so they laid siege to the fort. And after a long siege, the uh, British garrison eventually surrendered. And they marched out. And after they got a good distance from the fort, just like in that scene you see in The Last of the Mohicans, the Cherokee fell upon the uh, surrendered British column and many of the British soldiers were killed or uh, taken captive. So this was uh, something that caused a sharp uh, reaction amongst the, the British government. And so they ended up sending a British army into the lower Cherokee towns in South Carolina and ended up burning many of them to the ground. The Cherokee uh, worked out a peace settlement, and so when the war finally ended, they were very glad to be done with that. They had learned an important lesson of just how brutal these uh, frontier wars could be. Well, King George III, when the French and Indian War ended, he issued a proclamation of 1763 that forbidden his subjects from settling west of a line that generally follows the Eastern Continental Divide. And in this area, it runs uh, right along the crest of the Blue Ridge Mountains in western North Carolina. He basically said that the, his colonists could move up to that line, but no further. The land across that would be held in reserve for the Native Americans, which um, the Cherokee agreed to that settlement line. But you still had other things that almost caused war to flare up again. Three years after that proclamation was issued, you had a couple of long hunters, which was William Linville and his son John. They ended up getting killed near the mouth of what's today Linville Gorge by a war party. And the uh, initial reports was it was done at the hands of the Cherokee. And so there were a lot of cries for retaliation and going back to war with the Cherokee. However, the British Indian agent that was living in the Cherokee towns ended up sending a letter to the royal governor of North Carolina informing him that the uh, war party that attacked and killed the Linvilles was not a Cherokee war party. In fact, it was probably a party of Shawnees from north of the Ohio River. And that same war party ended up attacking one of the Cherokee chief's uh, sons as he was out picking blackberries near one of the Cherokee towns. So um, war managed to get avoided that year. But uh, this attack on the Linvilles happened in the first week of July, 1766, almost 10 years to the day before we declared uh, or signed the Declaration of Independence. Now, um, the Linvilles were long hunters and um, these long hunters, like I was telling you before, were frequently trespassing onto Cherokee and other tribes' lands in order to get primarily white-tailed deer hides. And I explained earlier just how much money was involved in this. Uh, one of the most famous long hunters was a man named Daniel Boone. One of his sons and uh, one of my uncles, uh, who was uh, one of the Crabtrees, uh, the Crabtree man's uh, sister ends up settling on Jack's Creek. And it possibly is the origin of the uh, Crabtree Creek name that uh, uh, runs through Burnsville, but we don't know that for sure. Regardless, these incursions by the long hunters kept uh, tensions running high. You had um, people getting killed on both sides uh, during this period, which basically just kept tensions at a low boil. In um, the early 1770s, you had a lot of settlers starting to cross the mountains, and they basically just became what we call squatters on the land along the Watauga and the Nolichucky River valleys over there. And so the British government ordered them to leave because that was a clear violation of the Proclamation of 1763. However, settlers in the Wills Watauga communities decided to turn directly to the Cherokee, and they managed to acquire a 10-year lease to the land from some of the Cherokee chiefs in May of 1772. Uh, however, the Cherokee's uh, younger warriors, and especially the British government, considered that lease to be illegal. In 1774, a company called the Transylvania Company, which was headed by a man named Judge Richard Henderson, sent a delegation of the Cherokee with a proposal. This proposal was to buy the land outright. And so the Cherokee held a council in December of 1774 to um, consider the proposal. A lot of the older men in the tribe uh, were in favor of selling the land to the Transylvania Company, while a great majority of the younger members were very opposed to this. The younger members knew that they were the ones that were going to be responsible for their hunting and things like that that would be greatly impacted by it. 
So um, at that council, they decided to send a delegation to Sycamore Shoals uh, in what's today East Tennessee near Elizabeth and to work out the details of that proposed purchase. And so more than 2,000 Cherokees attended that conference. And at that conference, the Transylvania Company straight up purchased what amounted to virtually the entire state of Kentucky, as well as most of Middle and Northeast Tennessee. And this transaction was finalized on March 17, 1775. That was just a little over a month before the first shots in the American Revolution would be fired at Lexington and Concord on April 19th. Now, a young warrior named Dragon Canoe, on hearing the details of the, this deal, uh, he stood up in the meeting and he stomped his foot and he pointed uh, out uh, mostly t towards the lands of Kentucky, but um, he also pointed around. And he warned those Americans that they had purchased a fair land, but they would find it to be a dark and bloody ground. Dragon Canoe then made a speech and in that speech, he gave a very eloquent and uh, what became basically a very true opinion of what was going to happen. He said, Whole nations have melted away like snowballs in the sun before the white man's advance. They leave scarcely a name of our people except those wrongly recorded by their destroyers. Where are the Delawares? They have been reduced to a mere shadow of their former greatness. We had hoped that the white men would not be willing to travel beyond the mountains. Now that hope is gone. They have passed the mountains and have settled upon Cherokee land. They wish to have that usurpation sanctioned by treaty. When that is gained... This same encroaching spirit will lead them upon other land of the Cherokees. New sessions will be asked. Finally, the whole country, which the Cherokees and their fathers have so long occupied, will be demanded. And the remnants of the Aniuia, the real people, once so great and formidable, will be compelled to seek refuge in some distant wilderness. There they will be permitted to stay only a short while until they again behold the advancing banners of that same greedy host. Not being able to point out any further retreat for the miserable Cherokees, the extinction of the whole race will be proclaimed. Should we not, therefore, run all risks and incur all consequences, rather than to submit to the further loss of our country? Such treaties may be all right for men who are too old to hunt or to fight. As for me, I have my young warriors about me. We will hold our land. And on that ominous note, he and his warriors left. Upon hearing of this land deal, the royal governor of North Carolina, Josiah Martin, issued a proclamation condemning the purchase, and the British Indian agent, John Stewart, instructed his deputy, Alexander Cameron, to work against the land deal being implemented. This dispute would drive many backcountry settlers into the Patriot camp when the American Revolution broke out. So, uh, when the American Revolution did break out in 1775, that forced a choice on every Native American tribe in the entire continent, or at least the eastern part of the continent. And they had three main choices. They could stay neutral, they could become allies with the Americans, or they become allies with the British royal government. And each of those options carried its own risks and potential rewards. Staying neutral was the logical course for most of these tribes at the beginning of the war, especially considering that the fighting went on for more than a year before independence was declared. There was little benefit to get involved in an internal family squabble when you would certainly have to deal with both sides in the aftermath of that squabble. Both the American rebels and the British at the beginning of the war worked to keep the tribes on the sidelines and out of the fighting. However, that attitude would change, and later both the British and the Americans would court various tribes as allies to take part in the fighting. So if they uh, decided to actively support the Americans, that choice actually probably had the least upside for them. You might choose to support the Americans because your traditional enemies chose uh, the other side. Or perhaps, like the Catawba, your tribe's situation and geographic location made any other choice impractical. Existing relationships also played a role in choosing to support the Americans. But there were some tribes, like I mentioned, the Catawba were probably one of the most prominent ones that decided to become American allies, and they actually played an important role in the American Revolution in the South. However, most tribes accurately realized that actively supporting the British probably had the biggest payoff. Supporting the British offered them the best chance for any of these tribes of maintaining their territorial integrity. 
And a British victory would almost certainly ensure that they would get the royal enforcement of the borders that were proclaimed in the uh, Proclamation of 1763, or at least uh, that would happen for a while. The British also were wealthier allies who could be more reliably counted on to provide the gifts of rifles, ammunition, and gunpowder that the Cherokee Nation and the other Indian nations were so dependent upon. The British were also viewed by these tribes as being the stronger contestant, and it was always best to side with the side that you thought was going to come out victorious, which they believed that the British would ultimately win the war, so they wanted to be on the winning side. And so for the entire year of 1775, the Cherokee maintained that neutral position. And they maintained that neutral position into the beginning part of 1776. However, things started uh, happening that worked against them and started to bring them towards open warfare with the states of Virginia, North Carolina, and South Carolina particularly. First of all, the Americans had promised to send them a shipment of ammunition, gunpowder and lead and rifles that the Cherokees absolutely had to have in order to do their winter hunts. That shipment, however, was seized during the contest in South Carolina between the Loyalists and the Patriots when they were struggling over who would control that state. So the shipment of gunpowder from the Americans never arrived. And it didn't help matters when the British sent a pack train of 20 horses loaded down with ammunition to the overhill towns, which arrived in April of 1776, clearly demonstrating that the British could supply the Cherokees for their needs when the Americans could not. Tensions also rose because the Patriots were circulating rumors that the British were going to do a coordinated assault where the British would attack with an amphibious operation on the coast of South Carolina and North Carolina. And while they were attacking down there, it would be supported by an uprising of Loyalist militia, as well as an attack by the Cherokee on the western frontiers of those states. This rumor was backed up whenever someone forged a document making it look like the British Indian agent Alexander Cameron had issued instructions to all the king's loyalist friends on the frontier to identify themselves so they would be spared the imminent attack of the Cherokees. This forgery was an incredibly effective bit of propaganda. It hardened a lot of the uh, settlers' opinions in favor of the rebels that were fighting the British government. It also enraged the Cherokee because they considered these outright lies to be an insult to them and uh, proof that the these new American rebels couldn't be trusted. So besides the fevered imaginations amongst the patriots, the uh, outbreak of the American Revolution also presented those young Cherokee warriors with a very real opportunity to try to take back their ancestral lands and push back the white settlers by force and push them back across the mountains and back as far east as they could get them. In May of 1776 and into June of 1776, a delegation of northern Indians arrived in the overhill towns carrying a black belt of wampum, and that's what you see on the screen now. These wampum belts were typically held up during the council meetings and were considered to be important diplomatic messages. A black wampum belt in particular was a sign of war, and so it's not surprising given just how badly that the Cherokees relationship had deteriorated with the white settlers that the Cherokees accepted this black wampum belt and began to prepare for war. And so um, the Cherokees decided to go to war with the uh, Americans and so they were going to conduct a series of hit and run raids aimed at the isolated frontier homesteads in both the over mountain country, southwest Virginia, western North Carolina, upstate South Carolina, and northern Georgia going to be the targets. Their strategy was basically do enough attacks on these isolated settlements and they could cause enough terror that would basically cause the remaining settlers to give up and to flee back east. And that actually did prove to be uh, what happened, at least at the beginning. So um, it became clear that they were going to go to war. The Cherokee beloved woman, known as Nancy Ward, she did not agree with the decision to go uh, to war with these white settlers. Nancy Ward 
had a very prominent role as the beloved woman of the Cherokee tribe, which she had earned in a battle with the Creek Indians uh, several years before. Whenever her husband was killed, she uh, took up and actually led the warriors to victory in that fight. And so she had a lot of prestige and uh, respect amongst the Cherokees. And so uh, she was one of the ones that had dissented against going to war with the Americans. And she carried that dissent beyond just disagreeing in the councils. She ended up actually sending a warning to the Watauga settlements that the Cherokee were going to uh, attack and raid those settlements. And so um, this is a picture of Dragon Canoe. This is an example of him that's in one of the Cherokee museums that you're seeing on the screen now. And so um, Dragon Canoe was the primary chief that was going to carry out most of these attacks, but there were other ones as well that were in favor of it. But the uh, warning did get to the Watayagan settlers in time, and so a lot of them started moving towards the different forts in the area. One of those was Fort Caswell, which was on the Watauga River. The Cherokee attacked Fort Caswell on July 21st, 1776. And then whenever they attacked... Oh, oh, on the screen now is Nancy Ward. That's a contemporary picture of what they think she looked like. When the Cherokee warriors attacked the fort at uh, Sycamore Shoals with the Watauga River, there were several people that were still outside the fort walls, uh, including a woman by the name of Bonnie Kate, who was out milking a cow whenever the Cherokee warriors attacked. And so Bonnie Kate was really quite athletic. And so whenever the Cherokee warriors came running up, she simply grabbed her skirts up and began running and was fast enough that she was able to keep in front of the Cherokee warriors. But as she was running towards the fort gates, the men on the inside of the fort shut and barred those gates before she got there because they were afraid that if in letting her in that the warriors would be right on their heels and be able to force their way to the gates as well. And so she began running around the fort walls with the warriors chasing her. And so she was absolutely terrified and looking for any kind of help that she could get. And as she was running, she looked up at the top of the fort walls and there was one of the men that was firing upon the Cherokee and their eyes met. And so he leaned over and reached his arm out, and she ran, and she jumped, and their arms clasped, and he successfully slung Bonnie Kate up over the fort walls to safety. And the man that did that was a man named John Sevier. He would go on to become a prominent officer fighting uh, against both the uh, British at the Battle of Kings Mountain as well as the Cherokee itself, and he would eventually become the first governor of the state of Tennessee. This episode was never forgotten by Bonnie Kate. And four years later, whenever John Sevier's first wife died, they ended up getting married in the weeks right before the campaign for Kings Mountain ended up happening. This is a view of the mouth of North Cove looking down through Pepper's Creek from McKinney Gap. And you can see Dobson Knob in the distance. So um, the Cherokees also started sending war parties through the different mountain gaps to attack the settlements in the Catawba River Valley here. And these attacks on the Catawba River Valley were just devastating. Some of the settlers had gotten words of warning that these attacks were coming. And so they started abandoning their frontier homesteads and farms and started to move back towards some of the different forts and fortified stations along the way. One of those groups included the Birchville family, which some sources say that they were living around um, what's today Lake Tahoma up near Buck Creek off of uh, Highway 80. And they uh, made their way along with some of the other frontier families and they passed through what's today Marion and about five miles outside east of Marion near one of the old cemeteries there, something spooked the cattle that they were marching and herding along with them and the cattle stampeded and ran off. Well, whenever that happened, the men and the boys in the group, they all took off after the cattle to try to catch them and bring them back to the column. And while they were gone, after they were gone for long enough that they were definitely outside of hearing anything that went on, seven Cherokee warriors emerged from the tree line and ran towards the column, absolutely terrifying the women and children that were there. And each of those seven warriors grabbed a child and ran back into the woods with them. And you can imagine just how terrified the families must have been at this sudden appearance and kidnapping of the children. Well, 
when the uh, men finally returned to the column, they organized a rescue party and went out after them. They followed the trail up to the top of a nearby hill. And at the top of the hill in a circle, six of the seven children were laying on the ground. All six had been scalped and five of them had died at this point from the blood loss. The five children that died belonged to different families that were in the column. One child belonged to the Dobson family, another to the Young family, another to the Hyatt family. Also one belonged to the Lytton family and the Leatherwood families. And the one girl that was still alive was a young girl named Lydia Birchfield. And Lydia was grievously wounded, having been scalped, but she managed to survive. And when the men got there, they were able to bandage her up, put a poultice on the wound, and started nursing her back to health with some milk and cornbread. Lydia would survive, and she would um, live well into the 1800s. But Lydia's sister, Mary Birchfield, was not amongst the children that they found there. In fact, Mary had been taken captive and been taken back with them. Mary was a little older than the other children, so she was considered to be a much more valuable captive than the others. Well, the war party took her and they moved up through the mouth of North Cove, up through Pepper's Creek, and crossed through McKinney Gap. And when they got through McKinney Gap, they followed Rose's Creek down to the North Toe River. At that point, all of the warriors, along with Mary Birchfield, who was unharmed at this point, uh, waded out into the middle of the stream, and then they started walking upstream going north. Sometime later, the rescue party came riding up, and exactly how far behind them we, we really don't know, but uh, some of the different sources give different lengths of time. Some of them say it was just a few hours later. One of them actually says that it was three days later whenever the uh, rescue party showed up. Regardless, there was a man there that was a hunter that had been hiding up in the side of the woods and had seen the war party enter the water like that. And the reason that they were waiting upstream is because the current in the stream would wash away their footprints. And so they were trying to hide their trail of exactly which way they were going. The hunter pointed in the direction he could being by himself. Uh, there was no way he could challenge and try to rescue Mary Birchfield, such a large war party. And so he pointed the way that they went and the rescue party took off going north. And they would follow what would become known as Bright's Trace right along the banks of the North Toe River. And somewhere probably up around where Roaring Creek is, they turned and followed the trail up over Yellow Mountain. But at some point on the side of that mountain, the uh, war party crossed over a lot of rocky ground, and at that point, they lost their trail, and they never picked it up. And so, at that point, Mary Birchfield disappears into the mists of history. We really don't know her fate. She could have been adopted into the tribe. She could have been traded uh, to another tribe as a slave. Perhaps she died of exposure or died of something else. But uh, as to what happened to Mary Birchfield, we do not know. Now, the creek coming down from Hefner Gap and McKinney Gap to the North Toe River in the Alta Pass community is called Rose's Creek. And according to Jason Deaton's master's thesis, Rose's Creek was named after a hunter that was killed along its banks by Cherokee warriors in these raids. And so there's no way to know for sure, but I sometimes wonder if the same hunter that saw Mary Birchfield pass through there was indeed that hunter with, with the last name Rose. And perhaps after the rescue party went by, he ends up running into other Cherokee warriors that do him in. There's no way of knowing for certain. It just seems like an interesting coincidence that we have a hunter that was killed at that same location, the same place where they were reporting seeing them go through. So I guess something we'll never know for sure, but it's definitely interesting. This um, story of Lydia Birchfield is um, a strong part of the local oral tradition in the McDowell and Mitchell County communities. So that story is really well known. For years, we were looking for some more hard evidence, though, to be able to back it up. And we finally found some documentation in the pension application of a man named Samuel Hillis. And he confirmed some important details of the story. He says, as a declarant in Wilson's company, he marched on to Rutherford's camp. And Rutherford at, uh, was a man named Brigadier General Griffith Rutherford. We'll talk about him in a minute. But he had made his camp on the mouth of Buck Creek near today's Pleasant Gardens. So, um... As I was saying, 
Samuel Hillis says that as he was marching to Rutherford's camp, he saw four children murdered and lying beside the road. He says that they were the children of a Mr. Birchfield, and they had been murdered by Cherokee Indians. He also says that another child, a girl of the same Birchfield family, was shot through the groin and left for dead but recovered. Several bodies of the murdered men were found before they arrived at Rutherford's camp. Now, Hillis was writing this application many decades later, so he probably confused a few of the details as the dead children were uh, not from the Birchville family as Lydia was the one that survived and Mary was the one taken captive, but they belonged to the families that we've mentioned already. Other things, this is a famous scene of a loyalist woman named Jane McRae that was scalped by warriors in the state of New York scene that's uh, similar to what went on a lot in the Catawba River Valley at this time. This is a painting that's done near McKinney Gap. Here is McKinney Gap where the uh, warriors passed through. Uh, they would have been passing through the fog right there in the foreground. Now uh, the scene that you're seeing here, this scene is of Turkey Cove and uh, that's right off of North Cove also part of the Catawba River Valley drainage. And at this place was the cabin of a man named Arthur McFalls. And Arthur McFalls was married to Mary Jane Pittman. And he uh, was out serving with the militia, trying to fight off these attacks. But he left his wife unattended in his cabin in Turkey Cove. And unfortunately, her cabin was raided by one of these Cherokee war parties. And they went inside and they scalped her and stole several items. Well, when um, Arthur McFalls returned to his cabin, he walked inside, and as he came into the dark cabin room, he looked over into one of the corners, and there was his wife, Mary, on her knees, weeping terribly with a big bloody bandage that she had managed to bandage her head with uh, in order to staunch the bleeding. And he went over, and he brought her out into the light a little bit, and he looked her over, and then he simply turned around, and he left and he never came back. And he abandoned his wife, saying that her beauty had been marred forever. And so um, Arthur McFalls would go on to take part in the uh, Rutherford expedition against the Cherokee towns. He apparently did enough good service in the army to help him out because years later at the Battle of Kings Mountain in 1780, Whenever the Patriots were going through the Loyalist prisoners that they took there, one of those Loyalist prisoners was none other than Arthur McFalls himself. There were some men that wanted to put him to death for switching sides, but because of his service in the Cherokee War, he was spared. Now, if you see the letter in the right part of the screen, this was a letter that was sent by Arthur's brother-in-law, the uh, brother of uh, Mary Jane Pittman, years later. And in this letter, he says that he is finally, after years and years and years of wanting to murder Arthur for all the pain that he caused his sister by abandoning Mary, Mary's brother finally decided that the best course of action was to simply forgive him. And so he wrote Arthur this letter telling him as much to that effect. Now, those raids on the Catawba River Valley left at least 37 settlers dead and hundreds more as refugees. And so they ended up pouring back to the different forts east of here. And so you then had how to respond to these Cherokee attacks. And so the states of North Carolina, South Carolina, and Virginia agreed on a combined strategy. Now, coordinating an assault between those three states, given the primitive conditions of the roads, not that there really was many roads to exist, they were basically trails, so trying to get messages back and forth between them would be really difficult, but they agreed that the best course of action would be that each of them would send their own army against the Cherokee with the different Cherokee towns as their targets. And so the Cherokee had been using guerrilla warfare tactics with these hit-and-run raids, trying to terrorize the people on the frontier into abandoning it. That's one reason that you would do the scalping. Scalping was a practice that existed long before European contact, but European contact made the practice far worse. One of the reasons scalping became so prevalent was because both the English and the French governments leading up to the French and Indian War would pay bounties for the scalps of the opposing side. And so that was one of the 
the uh, ways that you could demonstrate that you had actually killed a French soldier or a French settler or a British soldier or a British settler. And um, it wasn't just the Native Americans that were scalping people. The uh, frontier armies on both sides were also doing this practice. Uh, Remember we mentioned earlier back during the War of 1760 uh, with the Cherokee that the Virginia militia scalped 36 of the Cherokee warriors that they killed. And the reason they did that was because there was a bounty for those scalps. And so by paying a bounty for those scalps, that drove the practice up. And by the American Revolution, you would wanted to do a scalp so you could, uh, or take a scalp so you could take it back to the tribe to show that you had defeated an enemy in battle. And that was your proof that you were being truthful about it. Well, scalping also is a very effective bit of terrorism that you can do against your opponent to try to do some psychological warfare. And so because of these guerrilla warfare tactics where they would do these hit and run raids, these war bands were extremely difficult to find and to bring to combat on favorable terms. And so um, the American armies from Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and these are all militia troops. They're not continental troops that are coming out here to deal with this. These armies adopted a strategy where instead of trying to run down all of these different war bands and try to bring them to battle out in the forest, which they could virtually never do effectively on favorable terms, instead of doing that, they would simply um, march and go to the Cherokee towns and villages and they would burn those villages and towns to the ground and destroy any food supplies that they found there. So this was a strategy that was aimed squarely at women, children, and those too old to fight on the theory that the warriors who were fighting couldn't remain in the field if they had to worry about preventing their families from starving to death or dying of exposure. So this was an extremely cruel but also a very effective tactic because that is exactly what would happen. And so um, these different armies from these different states were given their assignments. And so South Carolina, they uh, put a man by the name of Colonel Andrew Williamson in charge of their expedition against the Cherokees. And his target was going to be the Cherokee lower towns and the middle towns. Williamson was a veteran of the previous Cherokee War in 1760. And after that war, he had bought a plantation, which was appropriately called Hard Labor, near a place called 96 in South Carolina. However, uh, Hard Labor was probably a little too on the nose for a plantation name, so he renamed it Whitehall. When the American Revolution broke out, he fortified that plantation, and he was the one that actually recaptured a supply of gunpowder that the Loyalists had stole in the first year of the war. He also took part in the Snow Campaign in South Carolina against the Loyalists and those that were still loyal to the British government. And because of his good service at the behest of William Henry Drayton, Williamson was promoted to colonel and he was chosen to lead South Carolina's campaign against the Cherokee. Williamson decided to use warriors from the Catawba Nation as scouts on his campaign. And the the Catawbas were always very effective warriors. But he didn't always listen to their advice. And on at least five different occasions, Andrew Williamson led his troops into ambushes. And that's situations like you're seeing on the screen now. Now, his men were extremely brutal. They burned to the ground 31 Cherokee towns and absolutely devastated all of the lower Cherokee towns. In fact, uh, most of these would never be reoccupied. He also petitioned the uh, South Carolina legislature to allow him and his men to keep any prisoners he took on this campaign as slaves. However, the legislature was afraid of what kind of effect that might have on the men, and so they actually denied that request. But still, a very brutal campaign that was launched in the South. Now, um, for us, and here in western North Carolina, the main focus would have been on Brigadier General Griffith Rutherford's expedition against the Cherokee Middle and Valley towns. And so he uh, was given command of the North Carolina force, And just a little bit about Rutherford himself. Rutherford was Scotch-Irish. He was born in Northern Ireland probably sometime around the year 1721. 
His parents decided to take him to America in 1729, but on the voyage across the ocean, both of his parents died. Some sources give these dates a decade later, saying he was born in 1731 and his parents died in 1739, but we tend to go with the preponderance of evidence that suggests the earlier dates. When the uh, French and Indian War broke out, he also served in that. He uh, served as a captain in the militia. And after the French and Indian War ended, he uh, basically took a page out of Sheriff Andy Taylor's from the uh, Andy Griffith Show's book, and he became both the sheriff and the justice of the peace of Rowan County, and he served in that position from 1767 to 1769. In May of 1771, he took part in the campaign against the regulators, although uh, he was not in favor of being too harsh on the regulators. After that campaign, he was made the colonel of the Rowan County Militia, and he led troops from the western part of the state in the Morse Creek campaign against the uh, Scottish loyalists that were marching towards Wilmington. That force was caught and destroyed at the Battle of Morse Creek Bridge. However, Rutherford once again did not arrive in time with his men to take part in that battle. Regardless, in April of 1776, Rutherford was made Brigadier General for the Salisbury District of North Carolina, which basically made him responsible for the defense of the entire western part of the state. Rutherford massed an army in the Catawba River Valley, and um, he set up his camp on Buck Creek near Pleasant Gardens in July. From that camp, he received word that there was a um, force of Cherokee warriors camped near what's today modern Irwin, Tennessee. And so he sent 500 men across the mountains to deal with those. Unfortunately, uh, one of the problems in studying this period of history is a lot of the evidence is fragmentary. We have a letter in the North Carolina State and Colonial Records saying that he sent this force over, but we never learned the results of it. So, um, But given the location of where his camp was and where the target was, it is almost certain that the, um, the men that he sent across probably passed straight through the Tow River Valley in order to get there. So that would make that the very first American army to pass through the Tow River Valley, a full four years before the more famous American army that went to the Battle at Kings Mountain would pass through the valley. Now, uh, his army numbered about 2,700 men, and he mustered them at um, Samuel Davidson's fort in what's today Old Fort. In fact, that fort is where the uh, name Old Fort for the town comes from. And so on September 1st, 1776, he took 2,400 men. So this is a picture of Old Fort that you're seeing on the screen right now. That's a reconstruction of the fort that's been uh, completed in the last decade or so. So he took 2,700 men and mustered them at Fort Davidson. And on September 1st, 1776, he left three of those there to hold the fort and took the remaining 2,400 men and he marched them through Swannanoa Gap. Now, his route through western North Carolina today is known as Rutherford's Trace. And back then, there's no roads to speak of. There's just trails and things. So trying to get supply wagons up through the mountains is impossible. And so instead of doing that, he um, had his men herd along some cattle so they would have some uh, beef on the hoof, as it's called. But the primary way that he's supplying his men is with pack horses. And so they're going to be um, traveling relatively light for an army of the time period. This is a map uh, that you're seeing now that uh, shows his route through western North Carolina. Uh, We know a lot of the details of Rutherford's campaign because one of his men, a man named William Lenore, kept a journal of the expedition. And so it's probably our best source uh, to know both details of uh, their route of march as well as details of the campaign itself. You can follow along if you was to do a driving tour of this. There'll be a lot of uh, of those silver and black North Carolina historical markers marking certain sections of it. For instance, whenever he's passing through what's today the city of Asheville, of course there's no city there at the time, uh, he uh, crossed the uh, French Broad River there right at the Biltmore Estate. So... Um, On September 8th, uh, his men reached the Cherokee town of Watauga. And whenever uh, folks hear of a Cherokee town named Watauga, 
They expect that town to be located in one of two places, either in modern-day Watauga County, North Carolina, or along the Watauga River, possibly in East Tennessee, up near Sycamore Shoals. However, both those assumptions are wrong. The uh, Cherokee town of Watauga was actually located in modern-day Jackson County, North Carolina. But his men, when they got there, they burned the village to the ground. And um, this would be a pattern that would be repeated quite frequently on this campaign. As his men were crossing what's today Hominy Creek, they actually surprised a couple of Cherokee warriors. One of those warriors was shot in the stomach, and uh, the contents of his stomach spilled out into the creek, which he had had a meal of hominy, and that's actually where the name Hominy Creek comes from, is from this campaign and the death of that poor man. But they... um, kept following the pattern of going from town to town, setting fire to these towns. Whenever they would get to the towns, a lot of times they would find them abandoned, as most of the um, Cherokees would had fled before they got there to the surrounding mountainsides, and some of them had fled all the way across the mountains to the overhill towns to take refuge there. But they did find people here, or Cherokee people here and there. Some of those Cherokee people were instantly put to death, some in very cruel ways, even including women, children, and the very old. There was two Cherokee women and a boy that were taken prisoner and a fight almost broke out about what they should do with them. Part of them wanted to just take them prisoner. Others wanted to take them prisoner and sell them into slavery. And the ones that were arguing in favor of selling the prisoners into slavery ended up winning out because they threatened that if they were not allowed to sell those Cherokees into slavery that they would simply put them to death. And so we do have records that at least two Two of the Cherokee women and one of the children were sold into slavery and they brought a price of $1,200. So, sad story. Now, whenever they're burning the towns down, they're not just targeting the towns. One of the important things that they're uh, trying to do is to destroy the Cherokees' food supply. And so uh, those big, huge fields of corn, they would set fire to if they were dry enough. If they're not dry enough, then they would simply ride their horses through and trample as much of the corn under the horse's hooves as they can. All told, the destruction that was uh, wreaked uh, during Rutherford's expedition was massive, but nothing on the scale that was achieved by Colonel Williamson and the South Carolina ones against the lower Cherokee towns. Rutherford's men ended up burning 11 Cherokee towns completely to the ground. Now, the final expedition was launched by Virginia, and They placed their expedition, whose target was the Cherokee over hill towns, under the command of Colonel William Christian. Now, Colonel Christian was born in Stanton, Virginia in the year 1743. And like the other two, he had also served as a captain in the French and Indian War, particularly in the 1760 war with the Cherokee. Before the American Revolution broke out, he also served as an officer in Lord Dunmore's War in 1774 against the Shawnees. He would survive the uh, Cherokee War of 1776 as well as a lot of other fights, but eventually his luck would run out because he kept getting into different Indian Wars after Indian Wars. And finally, in the year 1786, about 10 years after the time we're talking about now, he would be killed by warriors from the Wabash Nation in what's today the state of Indiana. Now, Christian's campaign, like I said, was the last launch, but it posed perhaps the greatest threat to the Cherokee as the overhill towns where the Cherokee refugees were located. It posed the greatest threat because those overhill towns is where most of the refugees from the lower, middle, valley, and out towns had fled from the previous expeditions. And so there were lots of refugees that were over there. If he had been as ruthless as Williamson had been in dealing with the Cherokee in South Carolina, it's almost unimaginable the amount of destruction that could have been achieved there. But luckily, Williamson was not as vindictive as the others. And so he took an army of about 2,000 men, and he did destroy several towns, but in total he only ended up in the end burning six of the overhill towns to the ground. It was enough, though. The Cherokees had 
seen such massive destruction of so many of their towns in total. They had 52 Cherokee towns that were burned completely to the ground with enormous amounts of food that also were completely ruined and a lot of that went up in smoke. In addition to the um, the towns that I've already mentioned that were burned, there were two additional Cherokee towns that were burned by troops from the state of Georgia. And another Cherokee town uh, was uh, put to the torch by a, a different group of North Carolina troops under Captain William Moore. But like I said, that brought the total Cherokee towns that were burned to the ground to 52. So just massive devastation. The Cherokees requested a ceasefire, and they would formally sign a peace treaty on May 20th, 1777. In that peace treaty, the the Cherokees ended up ceding more than a million acres of their territory, uh, including virtually all of their uh, land that was in South Carolina. So most of those uh, lower Cherokee towns disappeared from the map at this point. Now, uh, picture you're seeing on screen now is one that uh, you may want to pay a little bit closer of attention to. This is a map that was made in 1884 and it shows the full extent of the the Cherokee territory and the reason that it's color coded and broken up into these different colored sections is because those color codes respond to the key up there and that shows you exactly what sections of the Cherokee Nation were lost in which treaties at what point in time. But you can kind of see just how basically the entire Cherokee Nation uh, was consumed piecemeal through various treaties over time. Now, not everyone agreed with the um, Cherokee's decision to throw in the towel. In fact, uh, Dragon Canoe decided that he uh, was absolutely not going to uh, go along with the older men in the tribe and uh, work out a peace with these uh, settlers. He knew that he probably couldn't win in the end, but he uh, also knew that he was not going to go down without a fight. And so Dragon Canoe took uh, most of the younger Cherokee warriors and uh, their families, and they moved them downstream on the Tennessee River to uh, a place called Chickamauga. And so Basically, what you're looking at now is Lookout Mountain near the uh, modern city of Chattanooga, and this is where he went to establish those new Cherokee towns. Now, the Cherokee uh, Chickamaugas, they were able to keep up the fighting for decades. In fact, um, Dragon Canoe himself never surrendered. He um, would end up carrying on the fight until 1792, whenever um, he um, was celebrating a victory over the uh, settlers at a particular battle. They were having a uh, victory dance in celebration, and his health finally caught up with him as he had a heart attack and died. After his death, the uh, fight was kept up for about three more years by various members of the Chickamaugas and some of the other amalgamations of the tribes, primarily under a man named Doublehead. But most of that combat ended in 1795. So uh, that uh, war with the Cherokee went on for almost 20 years, 19 years to be exact. So Now, um, the Cherokee War had um, some... um, interesting effects. So how did some of the real famous founding fathers view the Cherokee War? Well, George Washington, he saw the Cherokee War as an example that he could use as an implied threat of America's power that would be useful to use against other Indian tribes. In fact, as his men were gathering the boats for his famous crossing of the Delaware River, which would take place the next day on December 24th, 1776, we have a letter that Washington sent to a tribe of northern Indians called the Passamaquoddy. And his letter to them ended with this. So this is how he closed this letter to this uh, northern tribe. Brothers, I have a piece of news to tell you, which I hope you will attend to. Our enemy, the King of Great Britain, endeavored to stir up all of the Indians from Canada to South Carolina against us. But our brethren of the Six Nations and their allies, the Shawnees and the Delawares, would not hearken to the advice of the messengers sent amongst them, but kept fast hold of our ancient covenant chain. The Cherokees and the Southern tribes were foolish enough to listen to them and to take up the hatchet against us. Upon this, our warriors went into their country and burnt their houses, destroyed their corn, and obliged them to sue for peace and give hostages for their future good behavior.' 
Now, brothers, never let the king's wicked counselors turn your hearts against me and your brethren of this country. But bear in mind what I told you last February and what I tell you now. In token of my friendship, I send you this for my army on the banks of the great Delaware River this 24th day of December, 1776. Now, Washington wasn't the only one that had thoughts on the Cherokee War. The author of the Declaration of Independence himself, Thomas Jefferson, just a little over a month after signing the Declaration of Independence while still in the Continental Congress, wrote a letter on August 13, 1776, that had an even more ominous reaction to these uh, Cherokee raids than Washington's letter had. In fact, Jefferson himself raised the prospect of removing the entire Cherokee nation to west of the Mississippi River in this letter. And so he wrote, and I quote, I hope the Cherokees will now be driven beyond the Mississippi and that this in the future will be declared to the Indians the invariable consequences of their beginning a war. Our contest with Britain is too serious and too great to permit any possibility of avocation from the Indians. This, then, is the season for driving them off, and our southern colonies are happily rid of every other enemy and may exert their whole force in that quarter. So um, you can see that the seeds for what would become known as the Trail of Tears were already getting planted in the minds of people during the war with the Cherokee in 1776. So, in conclusion, the Cherokee War of 1776 is largely forgotten today. It gets overshadowed by the larger events of the American Revolution going on around it. But it had a significant impact on the region and the nation. The Cherokee Nation never again posed the threat that it did that summer of 1776. In fact, that war reduced the Cherokee threat so much that it allowed a large contingent of militia from the mountains, many of who had fought in that Cherokee War, to mass and march across the mountains and turn the tide of the American Revolution at the Battle of Kings Mountain in 1780. It is extremely unlikely that they would have felt secure enough to make that campaign if the Cherokees still had the strength that they had in 1776. Although Dragon Canoe and his warriors carried on the fight even after the American Revolution had ended, they could not stem the tide of settlers. He never surrendered, and he died unconquered. Decades later, to our national shame, most of the remaining Cherokees were forced onto the Trail of Tears, and those that survived were resettled in Oklahoma far from their ancestral mountain homes. However, the eastern band of the Cherokee still remain in these mountains, and you can travel the Blue Ridge Parkway crossing many of the scenes where this all took place to its end and the Cherokee Indian Reservation where you can learn more about these fascinating people and their important story. I'd like to thank you all for taking the time to listen to me, and I hope that you at least uh, learned a little bit more about the American Revolution and the founding of our country and uh, the people and the sacrifices and the, the pain and whatnot that went into making it. So thank you all very much for listening to me, and I appreciate you all having me. Thank you for joining us for this program. Remember to visit MitchellNCHistory.org for more information about the Mitchell County Historical Society and our efforts to preserve the history and heritage of Mitchell County, North Carolina.